My name is Stephen Webb, and I'm the landscape ecologist in the Center for Land Stewardship. Uh, today I'm going to discuss animal tracking and sensor technologies. And so what I want you to do is just keep in mind uh, a beef sustainability program or any sustainable program for that matter in terms of these technologies and how they would re relate to animal health, welfare, and behavior, also natural resource conservation, and other production systems. So let me give a brief overview of GPS collars. We're probably familiar with these. Uh, and I'll talk about some new integrated technology into these units now. Uh, most of these collars were typically designed with wildlife in mind, and so they, they put in sensors such as mortality sensors that would notify the researcher when the animal was dead, or they would incorporate a very high frequency transmitter, that way the researcher could track and recover the animal even if the GPS unit failed. Uh, they also have drop-off mechanisms for wildlife species that we typically need because we can't readily get our hands on these species. So you can pre-program the collar to fall off on a specified date, or you can remotely access it and uh, re drop it off yourself. Uh, there's a couple of sensors that would be common to both wildlife and domestic livestock. They have temperature sensors built in, and they also have activity sensors, which will help you look at some of the behavior of the, of the species. Some of the new features of GPS collars are their communication devices. The two primary ones are Iridium communication and Argos communication. So with this, the, the user can now retrieve their data remotely from the collars. So what we have is we have our typical satellite system that will allow you to take a GPS point. But then you have a separate set of satellites where you upload your GPS locations to. They go then to a central processing center and then eventually down to the user. But that's not all. The user can also talk backwards and change some of the settings on the collar where they can change notifications, how often the GPS locations are collected, and a number of other features. So I'm gonna show you one example of us retrieving our data through an Iridium system, and this is for a wild pig study that's being done on the Red River Farm in collaboration between the Center for Land Stewardship and the Center for Pecans and Specialty Agriculture. We had 16 sows uh, that we put collars on, and we had them take one GPS location every 30 minutes for a very specific study as it related to uh, use of pecan orchards and grows and depredation. And so for this one sow here, this is about four days of data, and you can see that she comes out to the pivot where we have alfalfa planted about once every day, but she's also using the pecan orchard pretty heavily, and then during the day we see use of hardwoods along the river. Now, how do we use this data for management? We have all of these points, and so it really is a pretty time-consuming process to get at a product that we can actually use. But some of the tools that we're looking at getting are maps or spatial products that we can put into a geographic information system. And so I'll go over a brief example uh, for the particular pig study in the pecan orchards. So this would be an example of pig use of a pecan orchard before any pecan drop, or you can think of this in terms of an agricultural planting before it was planted. The areas in brown show that pigs virtually did not use these areas, but you have a few hot spots, the areas in blue, where pigs were intensively using a few of these areas for some reason or another. But as you might guess, once there's pecans on the ground or once you've, once you've planted an agricultural field, that whole pattern may change, where now we see a lot more widely distributed, intensively used areas, again, that's in blue. And so between these two, you would, you would probably manage the species and, and your production system quite differently. Also with GPS collars, they're starting to develop camera collars, whether by themselves or coupled with a GPS unit. Early on, we built our own camera collars using GoPro units, and there's a few commercial collar companies that build in cameras into their GPS units, so you have both the, the video along with each spatial location. On this particular video segments here, one cow was equipped with two GoPro cameras, one on top and one on the bottom. So what I want you to pay attention to is just the perspective of each camera. This is the top view camera of a cow grazing, and then we're going to reverse and we're going to see the bottom camera of this cow grazing. And so you can see a difference in the view that you get and the type of information that you can get. The bottom view shows a much more close-up view, but at times it's difficult to identify the species because it's too close up or there's shadows being casted. Some other behavioral type of uh, information you can get out is something like this. We have a line of cattle waiting to water, but here comes this freak up there with all this camera and technology hanging off of his neck, so he gets to move to the front of the line and water first. So it's just interesting to see 
you know, kind of from the animal's perspective, how the, the outfitted cow acts, as well as how the other animals perceive that individual. And we'll show one more little footage here that will be another animal contact and kind of a behavior. Again, this is an animal contact, or probably more accurately, an animal contact with a, with a camera. So we have two cows that actually go up and put their nose to the camera. Uh, in terms of contacts, this is important for disease spread because a lot of the diseases are transmitted through direct contact. So now we'll have the, the level of contacts and how frequently they occur. Next are what we call pinpoint GPS receivers. We call them pinpoint because they're very small in size. We would expect them to be relatively small because they're they're built into most of our smartphones. And so on the left, we have a unit that's about the size of a quarter and only weighs a couple of ounces. In the middle and on the right photos, these two units are about the size of a dime and weigh less than one ounce. So you can start thinking potentially about some of these applications, but one of the first ones that we looked at was another collaborative research project between the Center for Land Stewardship and the Center for Pecans and Specialty Agriculture to look at fox squirrel use of pecan orchards in terms of use of the the trees themselves as well as depredation. And so these were bought during really the first release of these collars. So we learned a lot by deploying these. The, the units were able to take a lot of locations, but what we ran into is a very short battery life. The battery only lasts about two weeks. And so the issue came up of recovering the squirrel within that two week period before the batteries died. And it did have a built in VHF transmitter, but that was also linked to the same battery. So we weren't able to get most of the data back. But they've come a long ways just in six months after we bought these. They actually built in solar panels to keep the batteries charged and they integrated a remote communication so that you could get your data without having to get the animal back in hand. Now with those other small units, again, think about the possibilities. These are the size of a dime. And so if we're, you know, now we can put them on birds, on reptiles. And so think of species of conservation concern. And this particular species in particular, the northern bobwhite, is one of those species, a species of conservation concern that you may have interest in with, with another one of your production practices. But why not put them on an ear tag? They're small enough to fit. That's what the early researchers thought. Well, let's just epoxy one to an ear tag and put it in an animal. But I think there's much more application than that. And that's what one of the commercial uh, manufacturing companies is trying to come up with. They're trying to come up with a, a new de newly designed ear tag that have solar panels as well as data communication in them. The issue that comes up right now is the weight of these ear tags and whether or not you know, the animal's ear can withstand that in terms of animal welfare. Next is Bluetooth technology. I bet we're familiar with that. If we have a smartphone, it's probably Bluetooth enabled. So there are some possibilities to link Bluetooth enabled devices, and some of those being like a Bluetooth beacon, with these beacons able to collect information such on motion, orientation, resistance, temperature, or, or integrating other sensors into this. So if you think about an RFID ear tag that we're familiar with, I would say we can definitely fit these Bluetooth circuit boards into an ear tag in the future and collect a lot more information than just simple animal identification or do asset tracking because I would rather have a lot more information not just on the animal uh, itself but the behavior and the welfare of that animal. The last group of technology I'd like to discuss are, as, are accelerometers, and as the name implies, they measure acceleration. And so these circuit boards are relatively small too, and they're similar to what's in a Bluetooth beacon. On the right over here, we have a slot for a micro SD card. So you can pop in your memory card, and that's where your data is stored for whenever you recover your unit. And I'll point out a couple of other features of the sensors that are built into this particular one that we hope to test here in the near future. We have a light sensor, we have a temperature and barometric pressure sensor, and then we have our accelerometer as well as a magnetometer, where the magnetometer can look at heading or direction of the animal, and that's based on magnetic north. So if you combine the data from the accelerometer with the magnetometer, and you know the starting position of the animal when you put this device on, you can actually reconstruct its movement path. So then you have movement data, behavioral data, as well as environmental data and health, health sensors. Here's what the particular unit looks like when it's put together. We have a clear cover on the top, that way your light sensor can work. This unit is ready to be put on to any GPS collar that we have in use, or if you don't have a GPS collar, they can just be fit by themselves onto a collar and collect much of the same information, just in a slightly different way. 
So here's what your data would look like after you collect it and bring it in. We see a lot of wave graphs, and so we have acceleration. Here's the magnetometer data. It looks at resistance as well as heading. And then there's energy calculations that go on that would be really useful in terms of animals and potentially like average daily gain. So in this particular example here, this would be something similar to our speakers today, uh, attending, a, attending a conference and sitting through presentations. So for example, the first set would be detecting behavior such as walking. This may be me walking up to the convention center this morning and walking around and looking at the exhibitors. And then it's time for us to start our session. So I go and have a seat, it detects that. There's a break, I get up, I walk around briefly, but I have to come back and sit down again. And so acceleration goes down, resistance goes down. And then now I'm on stage and this is the pacing and lecturing part, even though I'm not pacing right now, but should I be, you would be detecting this with a magnetometer, this constant change from one direction to another. Combining all that data together, you could model my energy expenditure throughout the day. And so hopefully it would be great energy expenditure so I could eat more. I want you to think beyond what I've presented today, and this was just a very brief overview. And in fact, I want you to think well beyond that. I want you to think outside the box, and not just outside the box, I want you to blow that box up so you're not tempted by the box, and give us ideas of how we can apply these technologies or other technologies that the foundation can research, test, and validate. And so with that, thank you, and please catch us at break.